Welcome to another episode of Space Bar. It's lovely to be with you. Hey, it's lovely to be with you on our new format, which I still haven't got the hang of yet. Live on YouTube with fancy graphics and everything. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Dallas Campbell in London. And I'm Susie Imber and I'm in Dublin. How is Dublin? You don't look like you're in Dublin. From your uh, backdrop. Kind of half on Venus and half in Dublin. That's true. Yes. Got it. Got it. Well, listen, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Old space bar regulars will uh, not be too dismayed, I hope, because we will have plenty of time for questions as ever. And then after this first bit of the show, the kind of official bit that we're doing on, on YouTube for an hour or so, we're going to migrate uh, to the after party, as it were, where it'll be raucous and wild and drunken and wanton. And you can chat uh, to your heart's content and argue about all kinds of things. Um, we've got a really, really exciting episode for you today. I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, we've got two fantastic guests who we've been pitching all week. So hopefully we'll have uh, lots of questions from you. If you do have questions, how do they do, they do it in the, in the uh, little Pop them thing? In the chat underneath. There we go where you can see us on YouTube underneath. Great. You should be able to put questions in the chat. And actually, our lovely friend Ali. Do you want to pop up, Ali? We'll be there we there's Ali. Bring your questions. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so use the live chat down the right hand side of the YouTube video and we'll be able to bring up your questions uh, throughout the evening. And you can submit video you can also questions. Submit as well. video. Yeah. How do you yeah. submit a video question, Ali? There's a link underneath the YouTube video. Uh, you can click on that and submit a video question too. Good. Yes, please do that. We'd love to have video questions. Great. Um, we want to say a big thank you to our sponsor, who is. Viasat. Viasat. So thank you very much, Viasat, for providing sponsorship and helping Excellent. us to be able to use this new format um, that we're that we're trialling, which we, we rather like. Um, the first, uh, the it, we used to go on into the early hours. Those of you that have been with us for a long time and probably are writing in the chat hello right now, uh, will know that this space bar used to go on to the early hours of the morning. This session will be an hour followed by the after party. So that's the plan. We'll try that's, and keep to that's that. That's the plan. Anyway, right, we've got a we've got two guests for you um, tonight. We've also got our space news, uh, Vix and Torsten. I think Vix and Torsten, can you give us a little wave? Vix and Torsten are going to be doing their little roundup of... Um, uh, 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 there they are. There's Vix and there Torsten. They They're going to be doing their roundup of what's new in space, presumably lots of stuff about Indian lunar landers and, and such, that kind of I stuff. I hope so. I, I hope, hope so. so. Yeah, that's really, really exciting. Um, and I think we had to mention something about competition as well, Susie, but I forget what it was. Uh, we're going to be announcing the winners of the Astro Agency competition at the end. So you have to stay right to the very end to find out if you were the winner. Right. So coming up in a little while, we've got Jody Barton. Uh, Jody Barton funds space companies. That's all you need to know. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a space company and you need funding then stick around for, for Jody. She'll tell us a little bit more in detail about what it is that she that she does. But before that, we are delighted to have the minister, uh, well, the minister, well, I don't even know what to call George Freeman, the minister of space, the, the minister MP of for Mid Norfolk. Where do we even begin with this <laughs> plethora of titles? George, are you there? I'm here. It's great to be with you. I finally made it. I've made space bar. It's great. I, mean, I, I was convinced you'd done one before, but maybe I just dreamt it. Yeah, I thought you'd done one before. Maybe hmm. I did, but that was before I was 56. So. Yeah. Ah. Oh, ha yeah. well, happy birthday if, if it's a. Yeah, thanks. Birthday. So I'm. Um, yeah, weird title. So I'm the Member of Parliament for Mid Norfolk and yep. the Minister of State for Science, Research and Innovation, which includes, to my joy, the Minister for Space. Is that an official title, the Minister of Space? Well, I don't think officially, if you looked on the gov.uk, uh, if you searched Minister for Space, you wouldn't find it. But if you searched which minister has responsibility for space, it's it would you. come up with me. 
That's an awesome, like when you were kind of at universities, I, I, I forget what you studied at university, geography, I think. Was it, it geography? Yeah, history and philosophy of science. I mean, I'm not That's a scientist. It. I'm not a proper scientist. Um, I would have dreamed, I mean, just to be a minister for science is extraordinary. Uh, I used to read, um, I got two elder brothers who were very much tuned in uh, for the Apollo landings. I was, I don't know, two or something or three. And I remember, and they had all the space books. And my elder brother won a, a scholarship book for being sort of clever age seven. And it was, you two shall go to the moon. Nice. And, and I used to secretly read it because it was his book. And it had pictures of a boy going on a school trip. Um, it would be a girl today, right? Girls going Probably. into space. Probably. But it was a boy going on a school trip. And basically, he smuggles his way in onto the spaceship with the help of a very kindly astronaut and goes nice. to space. And um, I mean, it's just the ultimate frontier of everything, isn't it? I, I'm constantly just enthralled by from the Carl Sagan truth, you know, from the DNA in our bones to the calcium in our teeth, we are but reassembled stardust. So there's something fascinating to me about the intracellular level atomic structures. I'm the minister for quantum. Huh. And we are, we're beginning to unpack the deep, deep, yeah, our deep knowledge of atomic systems, intracellular atomic systems and space at the same time. And these oh my two frontiers God. go together, I think. George, did you ever... Uh, you're of an age where you might remember it was 1976 there was a film a short film that came out an animation called powers of 10 by charles uh, and yes and it starts off um it's like an animated thing photographs like campers yeah. they're having a picnic in the lake in chicago and they pull back by a factor of 10 until they reach the edge of the universe and then go all the way back into the hand all the way into the the, the atom the atomic level and i remember being six years old watching that and having my mind blown yeah, I can't remember that, but I remember the first time I logged on to Google Earth. Are we allowed to mention that name? Yeah. <laughs> yes. We've heard and, that. It, and I remember it just, I was always fascinated as a boy by, you know, the three settings on the microscopes. Uh, you had like microscope one and then two and then three. I've always been really fascinated by what happens at different scales of interrogation. And I, I ended up having a career, I was a series of accidents really in biomedical uh, bioscience, mainly biomedical and some clean tech, some agri tech, basically funding companies um, and starting companies. So sophisticated investors like Jody, when I was younger and had a full head of hair, would finance a company uh, and then wheel me in to hire the first 20, 30 people and set it up. And so I've always worked in mainly bioscience. Um, space is a completely new portfolio to me. Um, other than reading childhood books, I knew nothing about it. And I know some of your viewers are probably thinking, how can he be a minister for space? He didn't know anything about it. And I think the truth is you, you need to have, for any of those sort of jobs, you need to have an inquiring mind, uh, a love of um, learning. And uh, I'm sure Jody will say this as an investor. The most exciting thing I used to have was when we were investing in a scientist, I used to get a privileged supervision, a tutorial on whatever it was. And I think being... You know, as being minister, you have to make some big decisions. You have to have a strategic vision for what the UK space economy really needs. And that really means listening to the people who know and then forming some judgments. You know, there are some big decisions. Um, for example, I had a decision at the European Space Agency. How big did we want to go? Uh, and I took the decision that if you're going to, I mean, I didn't vote for Brexit. I campaigned for Remain. But if we're going down that road, boy, have we better double our, you know, re really redouble our commitment to all the international organizations we are in. So I, I went with a big 1.85 billion. We put a big increase into ESA. So you, you get to make a few big decisions in your time, as well as give guidance on lots of little decisions, which come in every weekend in the box. It's an amazing job. And I feel very lucky to have done it. So I guess one of the things in your inbox over the last few months has, has been Horizon and, and our our funding. Um, I was just reading some news articles earlier, actually, ab about it. But maybe you can tell us the latest. We can get it straight from the horse's mouth. Yeah, well, look, the the latest is um, because of the size of the money. So our overall horizon commitment to this horizon round. Just very years. briefly explain what horizon is. And just in a sentence, just for those who might not know. Yeah. So horizon is the big European uh, Union, but open to others, uh, research project. 
classic European model. Everyone pays in according to how big their economy is. Uh, and then you can apply and win back grants from Horizon. The UK, I mean, it's a hundred billion dollar total uh, club. It's the world's biggest international research club, open to EU countries, but also others, non-EU, but uh, Canada, I think, are now members, and uh, I think uh, Japan. So other countries are in. It, it's a big contribution. The UK, oh, it runs over six years. We would have been putting in 14 billion, uh, but we also the lead beneficiary because we're good at science. So we would have got back, got back as in secured back to fund programs led by UK scientists about 12 billion. Um, skeptics say, what kind of club is that where you get back less than you put in? But I and most others. <clears throat> take the view that this is an extraordinary opportunity for UK scientists and researchers from all fields. Yes. And basically, if you're in the Horizon program, you can pick up the phone to another academic and say, hey, why don't we do a Horizon program? Exactly. And it's very easy to get five universities, three companies together. Uh, and the government's position is we specifically negotiated in the original Brexit deal to be in Horizon. That was a red line for me and for Boris Johnson, actually. Um, the European Union decided because of the Northern Ireland, the way Northern Ireland was working out, that they would suspend that agreement. Now, you can argue that that was, some, you know, an illegal act, but I mean, it was just politics. And when Rishi Sunak, as prime minister, cleared the Northern Ireland protocol with the Windsor framework earlier this year, EU said, great, come back in. Uh, and we're in the process of just checking on what terms and how much money. Basically, we've missed the first two and a half courses of a seven course feast. And we just want to make sure that we don't have to pay for the full seven courses. We missed two and a half years. <laughs> good. That's a we've, good way of fitting we, yeah, We've got it. loads and loads of questions coming in, but just before we move on to the questions, just very quickly, there's a few areas I just want to, I, I want to pick up on that have been in the news recently. First of all, Astra Carter. We know, I noticed that you were hanging out with the King and some astronauts at Buckingham Palace. What was Astra Carter all about? Yeah. So one of the things I've, one of the things you get to do as minister is choose what we should be prioritizing. And I have really gone hard on the space sustainability piece. Um, and two or three reasons for that. One, it seems to me, you know, if we're going to carry a new generation with us on this space journey and really unlock and commit to the space sector, we have to show that we're not going to repeat the mistakes of previous industries. And we go sustainable from day one, or at least kind of nearly. Um, and also, second, it's good business, actually, for the UK sector. So um, what, what I've made clear is, look, we we can't have a situation where the space is just a wild west. What are there? 8,000 odd satellites up there. Half of them have gone up in the last 18 months, extraordinarily. Of those 8,000 odd, two and a half thousand are redundant, floating around. And as I said to someone the other day, I mean, if you imagine a road system where uh, 8,000 vehicles, every third one is parked dead across the road almost nobody's insured there's no common registration standards i mean it's just, if we really want space to be the frontier of communications of sustainable science of deep space science we have to have some rules and little uk look if we're out of the eu we got some regulatory freedoms here's an area why don't we get together we won't convince china we probably won't convince america on day one but if we got together with canada norway switzerland japan australia and formed a kind of club of responsible, sustainable space nations, set some standards, maybe the others would follow. So that's what I've announced we're going to do. And the king uh, has made this one of his big missions as well. That's so we had a great day. Does, 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 he, does he get it? Does he get the fact that space isn't just fun and games? It's actually, it's actually a big business opportunity for the UK. Totally. And he gets also that it's the new frontier. And obviously he's been an outspoken, in, very unusually outspoken environmentally. As a mono, uh, as a member of the royal family, as Prince of Wales, and I, perhaps others did, perhaps thought when he became a king and monarch, he'd step back from some of that advocacy. And I think, much to his credit and our luck, not at all. He takes it as way beyond politics. It's about the planet. It's about mankind, humankind, our our commitments, our stewardship, and uh, so he. He's been to a few laboratories with me around the UK and he went to Astroscale with me, was fascinated to see our leadership, commercial and scientific in this, and has been a huge supporter of that push. And without crossing the line into po uh, politics, 
uh, the Palace were kind enough to organise. I, I had a seminar at um, uh, the Royal Society, an international seminar, and the UK sector who were working with me on setting out a sort of first kite mark, an international standard. And then the King held a reception at the Palace for all international, all attendees later that day. And he stayed for two and a half hours and I think he shook hands with just about everybody. He was fascinated and very committed. Let's get him on the space bar. He'd totally got that. <laughs> we talk, often when we think about sustainability, we think about space junk and clearing up space and that kind of thing. But I wonder whether this idea is really extending towards other aspects of the space industry, like the launch industry, like rocket fuels and all the other aspects um, of, of sustainability that, that go beyond just sending things into space and making sure that they come back or go into a graveyard orbit. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I've set out that our initial industry, I can't call it a kite mark because kite mark is actually a patented term, but you know what I mean. Uh, this autumn, <laughs> yeah. we, I'm going to be setting out shaped by the UK sector for me with my officials, a very basic um, quality mark, uh, sort of green satellite, uh, based on some very clear, simple metrics that everyone understands. And if you're compliant, then we're going to uh, provide those who are compliant with uh, more competitive insurance. Insurance industry, Lloyd's, of course, major space insurance. They already monitor the risk of, of debris uh, and it's a big issue for them, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure compliant companies get quicker access to finance. Seraphim, mm -hmm. world space, leading space investor, VC in London, very supportive. And thirdly, we are, I want to look at giving people quicker access to regulatory approval for both launch and land. Uh, uh, and that the idea is that standard will grow. Uh, to your point, Susie, this goes, I think, a lot further in the end. I think we've got a choice. Do we want to build this space at comms uh, network on volume of metal, just more and more and more metal? Or do we want to reward hyper-networked, connected constellations? And I'm very clear that we should go the latter route. And that then takes you into, you're then rewarding smart antennae, really smart use of spectrum. Actually, the things that the sponsors of this um, uh, podcast tonight, you know, the, the merger via SAT and Intel SAT, uh, I think is a really interesting opportunity for the UK to lead in smart spectrum, smart antennae, smart use of limited uh, metal in space. And that's where we should be going, not he who can get the most number of satellites up, the amount of metal up wins, the smart antennae win and the smart use of spectrum. Leadership. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, just gonna, Susie. No, 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 carry on. I interrupt. Is there you. opportunity for people to feed into any of this? I know we've got lots of interested people online who I'm sure have lots of, of thoughts and, and ideas. Is there an opportunity for that as part of this process? Yeah, there absolutely is. Um, we are at the moment, there's a little working group set up of um, key sectors of the UK space sector, all the companies you'd expect, um, officials from DSIT, uh, Department of Science, Innovation, and Technology, uh, and Lloyd's. Um, stock market um, we're looking to set out the first charter mark this uh, there's a date being fixed November I think but this is very much the start of the journey uh, so we're really keen to have input um, I'll try and put in the chat if not I'll give it to you offline and perhaps you can put it in your chat so that yeah. people can follow the work follow the launch um, but the idea is it'll be an organic standard I'm really pleased that the one thing the industry said to me was uh, George this is great but we can't do it unilaterally. We need some other countries to come with us. And I'm really thrilled that Canada, the Canadian minister said, this is great. We're in. I'll come over and sign up with you. Right. Uh, and, you know, I don't think Beijing and Washington will be the first on the list. But I think if they see this, the center of gravity moving and Britain, yeah. Canada, Switzerland, Norway, I think we'll move the market. Great. Before we move into questions, I'd love you just to talk very briefly, if you would, just because obviously Astro Agency were, uh, are in Scotland. Scotland seems to be a big player in, uh, not seems to be a big player, is a big player in UK yeah. space. And I'd love you just to chat a little bit about what, what's exciting you in Scotland and what's impressing you in Scotland and the Scottish space scene. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, funny enough, one of the highlights for me of the reception at the Palace was introducing uh, His Majesty the King to... Um, a really exciting company from Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And he was very struck by how distributed as a sector this is. And uh, I'll leave your 
the viewers to guess which of the three companies. Uh, Space Forge in Wales is a clue. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I think the British economy really deeply needs, a big part of my mission is sectors of the economy that aren't just in Cambridge, Oxford, London, the Southeast, that are creating growth and sustainability all around the country. So space is key to that. Um, what are we at now? 17 billion odd turnover, 46,000 employees. The Scottish sector is eight and a half thousand staff. But more than that, uh, Glasgow is now known as Satellite City for a good reason. I worked there on economic development 25 years ago, and it was pretty heavily public sector, yeah. quite depressed, recovering, but didn't have enough companies. I mean, boy, you go there now. I went up as, to see the sector the other day, and I saw Spire. I saw a whole raft of companies. I met an 18-year-old girls from Glasgow high schools working as um, on satellite tracking device. I mean, extraordinary. And I think space in, in Glasgow, Greater Glasgow, Strathclyde, is driving manufacturing, optics, photonics, a whole raft of... Uh, it's, a, it's a really industrial renaissance driven by the space sector. It's, you're absolutely. Well, I was in Strathclyde University only yesterday, talking to talking to young kids, doing talking to them about space. And I remember when I was a kid growing up in Scotland, you know, the industry was it was oil, shipbuilding was on the wane, but it was all about heavy industry. And now, of course, they've got this new vision, this new this new future. So it's really exciting. Spire, I yeah. noticed Spire were at Buckingham Palace. I think they were the Scottish. They were. I think, they were. I think they I were. saw Hina. Two out of three. You got two out of three. And, and, and of course, launch as well. Um, yes. You know, we're not going to be. Um, the world's number one launch destination. But I've taken the view that, um, you know, in a market where we're going to see a, a huge number of small, low Earth observation satellites over the next 10 years, you need a, uh, you know, the UK is ideally positioned. Cornwall, Scotland, we go out, out over the ocean, up into the uh, uh, Arctic very easily. It's a good LEO launch site. So, uh, I'm really excited about next year. We'll be seeing uh, from from Scotland. We've got launch sites in Sutherland uh, and in the Shetlands, and I think Scotland could be the first country in Europe to launch, which is pretty exciting. That is exciting. Um, Ali, questions. We've got a million questions, and we don't have George <laughs> do. for long. So where do we even begin? We do have a million deluge? questions. Um, let's begin with this one. Uh, Rebecca would like to know, how is the UK encouraging students into the space sector, particular, particularly in areas other than engineering? Are there any plans to encourage students at an earlier age than currently? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, you may say not enough. And I, I think the skills... Um, question is really key. So uh, Leicester are doing really good work, the space park, there, which I went up to open with Tim Peake. And their big focus is this very point, is that it's not just sort of Imperial or Guildford or Glasgow or Warwick or South Wales, the engineering, but we have to inspire the next generation to come and see the range of jobs and opportunities that the space sector is creating and get the parents excited and get teachers all those people on the educational journey to say to little Johnny or little Juliet, yeah, you should think about the space sector, some interesting jobs. So there's some really good work going on. Um, and actually in the T level and the apprenticeship program, it's taken us a long time. I mean, too long in government, but I think we're beginning to really build a proper sort of vocational career path. So that if you from 16 to 18, you don't have to go into a, a kind of classical academic subject and then come back round. You can, you can go right through. And there's some very good space apprenticeship programs. Um, and I think that the real challenge will be making sure that people understand applications and that space informatics opens up a huge new raft of opportunities in everything from agri-tech, clean tech, emissions tracking. So I think people think space means rocketry uh, and kind of high altitude, you know, zero gravity super athletes like Susie or you, Dallas. But um, <laughs> I think people are beginning to, what we need to continue to encourage people to understand is the raft of jobs that this sector is creating. And that uh, that's an ongoing challenge. It's a very good question and one we're, we're very yeah. exercised by. 
I think the other point to, to mention, we talk about this on Space Bar occasionally, is that a lot of us do a lot of work in talking with young people of, at all ages from, you know, year five space, because it's part of the national curriculum, all the way through to sixth form and university and beyond. But actually, I think the other the other area that we need to work on is how we help people transition into the space industry if they have a, a, a career in a different industry and they're interested in, in moving across. And at the moment, it's quite challenging to find avenues into our industry if you've been a banker or you've you've I don't know been an accountant but we need these people and so you know I think we're interested looking forward and how we can support those transitions a bit better yeah yeah completely and I mean we put millions the answer to the question is I haven't got the number at my fingertips but there's millions invested in these um, uh, skills programs around schools and colleges and the apprenticeships but I think it goes back to that really important point about the distrib distributed nature of the sector you know, from Newquay and Cornwall, South Wales, Strathclyde, Glasgow, Sutherland, the Orkneys, Shetlands, East Anglia. Uh, yes, there's the Guildford M3 Surrey Satellites Corridor, but actually all around the country, we've got clusters of really sophisticated space companies. And one of the things I put in place is a skills mapping exercise in DSIT. So we look at the high growth sectors and over the next 10 years, what are the skills that each company and the clusters of companies are going to be envisaging the jobs they're creating, just mapping them so that mm. we can then go to all the schools and colleges and say, just to let you know, in your part of the world in the next 10 years, the space sector is going to create 10,000 jobs or 20,000 jobs. Basic stuff. But that will really help, I think, the next generation to see the opportunities. Um, Ali, time is not on our side. So maybe we could do a few quick fire questions. I know there's a video question that's come in as well. So I don't know if you want to do that, but let's let's see if we can cram a few more in while we've got George. OK, great. So quick fire question. Uh, Kellyanne Myers would like to know, how do startups encourage funding in an already saturated space? Well, golly, we've got Jody coming on later. She's the expert on this. I mean, I think the there's a big difference between those companies that need, you know, tens of millions uh, to get launched up into orbit. Um, there are tons of really exciting Earth observation uh, software companies. who, You know, they're being started by two or three people, yeah. two or three students. So it is actually very easy. Uh, the key is to get to know the sector and to take advice, ask around. Most people in this sector, I love it. I, nobody minds being asked questions. Uh, there's a very strong bond. So if I was 18 or 48 and started thinking to start a company, <laughs> just Google some folks, go on shows like this. It's a sector that is really up for helping new entrants. Perfect. Great. Let me play our video question. Uh, for yeah. You. Hi, Minister Freeman. My name is Stefania, and I'd like to know what can other countries learn from the UK space sector and what can other countries learn from the UK? Great question, Stefania. Um, well, firstly, I don't think we've got everything right. I mean, um, but I think we've got some some really good lessons. Firstly, you know, we, we've been doing space science uh, for a very long time. I was uh, recently, at, well, I was walking my dog, actually, and I found myself walking through the Cambridge um, Astronomy Department. Extraordinary. Um, I've been doing it since sort of 1680, 1690. So deep science will tend to pay you back long term because your understanding um of how systems work is very powerful so i think that's the first point second point um you know the we don't have a big prime we don't have a big integrated um prime launch business operation we don't have a spacex we don't have a ariane but we have i i've described the uk space sector as a formula one pit lane um kind of without a car but the point is there are a lot of cars coming along and if you're really good at what you do, um, we've got some amazing companies, not just from Sari Satellites to uh, Astrium, now uh, part of Airbus, to Spaceforge, to Spire, to CubeSat. To... So we've got a raft of those kind of mid-cap companies that are really poised. And I think the key is international collaboration. And this sector is going, I think, from a sort of vertically Cold War sovereign military structure to an open international commercial structure. And I, I think the UK, it's the only thing. We're not big enough to go it alone. We're internationalists to our fingertips. And my big mission is let's uh, really make sure we're on the front foot in growing the international networks of skills, of science, of shared data, 
of um, collaboration because we're really good at that and we're not big enough to go it alone and the world needs us to be better connected. Now, those would be my lessons from the UK. Yeah, and leadership, presumably. You were talking about, you know, kite marks and such. Actually having a leadership in the way that we do things seems to be something that we we naturally gravitate towards. Yes, you know, it's a great privilege for me as Minister of Science. I, we have our own G, G8 or G7 Science Summit, G20 Science Summit. And, you know, in, in a country, we're really good at beating ourselves up, right? We're really good at doing ourselves down. And God knows the political class make it easy. <laughs> um, but when you go abroad and represent our country in science, boy, are we respected uh, mm. in engineering, in science, in research. And it's an incredible thing to see. And, yeah, I think there is an opportunity. The, the Union Jack is really respected around the world. And I, I really hope that when we put the Union Jack up on space sustainability standards, people will say, you know, that, that's that's the Brits. It's um, it's good business, but it's also good for everyone. And mm. that's what you expect, kind of Olympic spirit. Yeah, And I, I think we have a real le leadership role and we don't make enough of it internationally, particularly in areas like this. When I'm prime minister, we, I shall be, I shall be, I shall be pushing that. So good. Man. Um, good. OK, um, <laughs> Ali, how are we doing? We're, I, I'm conscious we're, we're sort of halfway through. Do, which, one more quick one. What do you think? One more quick um, question. And then we'll go on to the news and then we've got we've got Jody. I'll go quick. I'll keep it short. Yeah, so sure. one in, in a yes a yes or no. <laughs> yes or no. Uh, Chris Lee would like yes. to know at what <laughs> at what point should we be concerned about the degrading of satellites and its impact on our community and society? That's not yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the answer is now. Like a massive three day seminar. <laughs> yeah, the answer is now, isn't it? Um, I, I think yeah. it's to your point, Susie, earlier about. The sustainability thing isn't just parking the redundant satellites in a dead orbit. It's not just um, making sure that we're not chucking up junk that will disintegrate. It's, it's really about thinking of space as a precious commodity, making sure we can continue to see through it to do deep science and making it resilient and reliable. And these are values that I think we're going to have to build into everything from a milk bottle to an apple to a car's. So we better get the hang of it. I think one of the exciting things about space is be because it's so ex it has traditionally been so expensive to get there and energy, water, all the commodities that you we need are very precious. It's the ultimate laboratory for micro efficiency, micro dosing and for being really smart. And I think that's partly why space holds the key to sustainability down on earth not just because it's the best place to see our precious planet but it's also the best place to develop incredibly high performance efficient uses of scarce commodities uh, and that to some sort of hard green anarchist that'll sound ridiculous how can space be the solution to sustainability but i i just genuinely believe that often it's the people who go the furthest that then have a chance to put the most back and this sector i think has that spirit I think that's a good place to pause. George, thank you very much indeed. What a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, do thank stick you. around if you'd like. I, I'm, I'm conscious that you're in, you're, in, you're in Norfolk and you're there with the dogs and family and stuff. So, so don't feel obliged to stay. You can... Uh, Definitely. But, I want to hear Jody. Well, there we go. Fantastic. We're going to have Jody in a minute. Jody Barton is going to be with us in a minute. Uh, but before Jody uh, comes on, we've got some space news. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the August edition of Spacebar News. So the big items this month are the moon landings. The Indian Space Research Organization has successfully soft landed the Chandran-3 lunar mission on the moon's south pole, whilst Russia's state space corporation, Roscosmos, announced that the Lunar 25 automatic lunar station collided with the moon's surface and subsequently perished. So this seems to have played out in the media as a mini space race, Torsten. Why is this interesting um, geopolitical... Uh, why, why has this interesting geopolitical play happened right now? First of all, it's an absolute awesome moment for all of us in the space sector. Many of us watched Barashi, Chandrayaan 2, iSpace um, live, and we had to learn it's a hard way. Space is hard. So congrats to our friends in India for the soft landing. What is now on, these, on their established 
Indian Lunar Day on the 23rd of August, but I think it's pretty cool. Yes, it's a geopolitical power play in place. We could eyewitness the Modi and Xi a statement at the BRICS conference in South Africa last week. China, US and allies, the Artemis allies, including Europe partially, now India and maybe Russia. This is a geopolitical race for security and resources. Latest news from yesterday, the Indian rover found in the moon regularly sulfates and it's looking for hydrogen in the next days to come. So why is that important? This is needed for any production, any autonomous settlement on the lunar surface. Long answer, but it is a super exciting topic and heads up here to our next Space Cafe Black Ops by Dr. Emma Gatti. Um, she will host Dr. Namrata Goswami about the Indian space policy in a geopolitical context. So save the date or the 27th of September. And back to you, Wix. Thank you. OK, so the next story is the Axiom, the Axiom Space has announced that it's secured a $350 million um, in its Series 3, uh, sorry, Series C growth funding round. Um, what, what's this all about then, uh, Torsten? More excitement. So we saw two... <laughs> Uh, Saudi astronauts, and I would call them space tourists, honestly, uh, on the ISS earlier this year. And now we have the second UAE astronaut there. This investment by Al Jazeera Invest secures Saudi Arabia now direct access to human spaceflight. This consequently also positions um, the company um, Axiom as second to SpaceX for the most amount of money raised in a private space company in 2023, based on the available or a pitch um, book data. Talking previously about our geopolitics, this is a space to watch. ESA has now two upcoming astronauts from Sweden and Poland on upcoming uh, AX missions on SpaceX. I mean, at the moment, Axiom is a space travel agency. And I know that's not fair to say, but that's what, what is. But on its way to having its own private space stations in LEO, in Le uh, low Earth orbits, so we can connect the dots to space tourism and private space research here and to access to space for countries that has that are no ISS partner and are no ILS, uh, allies to the ISS. So exciting times, definitely. Back to you. That is very exciting. Um, OK, so the launch service provider Rocket Fac Factory Augsburg AG has raised a $30 million investment from KKR, which is a global investment firm. So this sounds just like another investment story, Torsten. So what's new in this? Yeah, because it's Augsburg. No, KKR. Um, <laughs> uh, KKR is known also as uh, Cobra, Kravis and Roberts & Co. It's an American global investment company that manages multiple available asset classes, including private equity, energy, infrastructure, real estate, credits, and through its strategic partners, hedge funds, as Wikipedia tells us. Did you hear space here? I didn't. So, no. There, this is their space, their first space investment um, in a European micro launcher. And this year is very critical uh, for the, the launch, the, the micro launch industry here in Europe. Um, it's critical also support for the Rocket Factory Augsburg development as a handful of launchers talking about their maiden flight for later this year. And I mean, as we are almost having September, uh, there are not so many months left. So that also requires the readiness of launch pads. So Rocket Factory Augsburg will launch from Saxaford in Scotland to make the UK connection like High Impulse, PLD from Spain and ESA Aerospace from Andoya and where I will be on the 4th of October for a status event and report from Andoya um, where they are. So that's interesting, super interesting and exciting for Europe, at least. So back to you. Absolutely. Um, right. So the Vespa payload adapter appears to have been hit in orbit. Um, so th this is the story about the European Space Agency who has received information from the United States 18th Space Defense Squadron that it has detected new objects near the Vespa payload adapter. So what does this mean to it for us, Torsten? This is tragic. Honestly, I mean, we talked so much about space sustainability and we hear that often, very, very, uh, very often uh, these, these days. 
And this is space sustainability in action. ClearSpace statement was in their press release, the development of the ClearSpace One mission will continue as planned while additional data on the event is collected. ESA and industry partners are carefully evaluating the event's impact on the mission. A full analysis will last for several weeks. I asked them about an update, but did not get one, unfortunately, uh, the last day. However, two days back, EUSST, the European uh, tracking um, entity, um, they could measure six new debris parts. Important. These are their own measurements, not just American ones from the 18s or other entities. So will that have an impact on their, on clear space mission? I'm very sure. I'm very confident. Um, in, in really, in, in, a, in a very sad way. It shows definitely that we have to act much faster and prepare for the unknown. The space environment is dynamic. The planning cycles have to be faster. We need more in, uh, current data. And this fragmentation event underlies the relevance of our ADR, active debris removal missions, so clear space, also including astroscale um, and others. The most significant threat posed by larger objects of space debris is that they fragment into clouds of smaller objects and then um, each cause significant damage on active satellites and human outposts. To minimize the number of fragmentation in events, we must urgently reduce the creation of new space debris and begin actively migrating the impact of existing objects. And I honestly can hear, and we have the minister uh, in the house, I applaud the UK government for their initiatives and activities nationally and internationally. And stay tuned for our reports about the current session of the Open Ending Working Group on Behaviors in Outer Space that just uh, happened in uh, Geneva. And then back to you, Vix. OK, so uh, not, not very good then. Um, right, the Nature Data Specialist uh, Space Intelligence will map two African nations to support integrity and transparency in the carbon market. Uh, the maps for te uh, Kenya and Tanzania will help to provide a baseline for all verified carbon standards, uh, uh, standard projects, which aim to stop unplanned deforestation in all countries. Uh, why does this matter, Torsten? This news is close, absolutely close to my heart. And I know we could spend here much more time, and I know we run over time here with this new section, but um, however it is how it is. So we see here a solution to support our fight against climate change as we need to turn words into action. Europe, and we talked about the issues that have Europe without mentioning them earlier um, with, with the astronauts and the launchers, but Europe can be relevant. Europe can produce relevant software and relevant analytics. And in this case, from a Scottish company. And one more event to promote what I'm doing proudly as a global Scot. Up next week by the Scottish Development International, it's the virtual Scotland-Germany matchmaking Earth observation for land management event on the 5th and the 6th of September. And just register there. And I think that goes along this line of the software use in other countries as well. Okay, and finally, um, an alien story for you, Dallas. Uh, NASA scientist Dr. Michelle Thaler, I assume or Thaler, um, has a fascinating theory that Venus might be hiding some extraterrestrial life forms. She thinks that the planet's thick and acidic atmosphere. She thinks that the planet's thick and acidic atmosphere, which is mostly made of carbon dioxide, could have some clues to life. Um, so that is that is it from us. Torsten, do you have any last words? Oh, oh yeah. Um, I mean, as, as Germans are not funny at all, so I, I like to point to an exciting Space Cafe podcast, <laughs> our 86, by G Guillermo Sönlein, um, and from Titan Tragedy to the Venus. And he runs Human to Venus and talks about living in the Venus atmosphere in the next 50 to 100 years. So nothing to do with aliens, but at least an outlook into an interesting and a very interesting thing. Because in the Venus atmosphere, you find an, uh, an altitude where gravity is, is OK, the atmosphere is OK. And um, I mean, the surface is damn hot, as we all know. But these are details that we will figure out later on and 100 years. Come on, it's, it's after us.
That's that's great. Is is that the one um, where they're actually looking at living in the Venus atmosphere? Indeed. indeed. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, that's all from myself and Torsten, and we shall see you on the next orbit of Spacebar News. Back to you, Dallas and Susie. Wow, I'm biting my tongue <laughs> on living in the Venetian I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one, maybe soon it'll be aliens, but not now. No, no. no. So, moving on from our lovely space news, let us speak to our next guest. Uh, we have Jodie Barton joining us right now. She is the CEO of City Court and Co. Jodie, welcome. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Dallas, for the opportunity to uh, share a, a little bit of financial insights. Nothing about aliens coming from me. <laughs> oh, you've got to get a bit of alien in there. Some <laughs> people not investing in aliens. Is that not a, not a thing? I'll, I'll try to sneak something in a book on aliens, perhaps. Great. So I think you've got a few slides for us. Here we go. Yes. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. My name is Jody Barton. I run uh, uh, an investment bank in London called Citicorp. We're the first um, space specialist corporate finance firm in the UK and Europe. Uh, not the only now, but we were the first. And we funded and, and are working on a number of projects in the space sector in the UK and Europe. So just to chronologically a little bit, 2021, as you all know, was a fantastic uh, time for the space sector with all the mega mergers, the huge amount of investment into the space sector. Since then, the world's been in a continued meltdown, as you know. So, But the good news is we have now entered into a correction and a recovery mode. So after U.S. mortgage rates have hit their highest levels in 23 years with 30-year fixed rate mortgages at about 7.09%. So moving on and straight into the numbers, although the UK government has been brilliant in supporting the sector, there is a problem and with a problem always comes an opportunity. So in the UK and Europe in particular, there is a big investment opportunity in the space sector. So let's jump right into the numbers. As the greatest um, number of space companies remain private, bridging the gap between public and private funding is absolutely paramount. So there was over 370 billion pounds private equity assets under management in the UK last year. And these guys are sitting on billions of pounds of dry powder, which could be invested into the space sector. So demand for space-based assets is going to continue to grow exponentially, of course. In 2020, our space economy, including satellite services in the UK, was worth an impressive 370, again, coincidentally, billion and represented more than 17% of the UK annual GDP. As George mentioned earlier, the total space industry income grew 5% in real terms last year to 17.5 billion, the second fastest annual growth in the last seven years. So you might be thinking, raising investment in the UK for these emerging companies is surely a breeze. As many of you might agree, in reality, it is not. For specialists, however, it's possible. You know, space is a hard, hard sector, sector to understand. And as a lot of you may know, investors will not invest in things they don't understand. So remember, it's not only the investor sitting across the table from you or on the screen across from you. He or she needs to also be able to understand your opportunity well enough to explain it to his colleagues or trustees. So it's very important that, and my advice is, that the fundamentals of the opportunity need to be drilled down to the most basic components when talking to investors. So don't make it fantastic, make it basic. So we have, um, we have uh, six space investors in the UK, believe it or not, compared to thousands in the US, and the odd PE and VC who will make one or two direct space investments. We also managed to get funding from corporate venture capital and strategic investors from our for our projects. So you can compare this to thousands of UK investors in the AI sector, telecommunications, data management, data storage sectors. So why not in space? Well, in my view, it's frankly a matter of time. 
So space will be everywhere as the space sector morphs like the technology sector did in the 1990s and becomes something which weaves together all sectors. Currently, the space industry is essential for over 47 different industries. So helping this along, myself and CityCorp are part of a roundtable action group, along with George Freeman, your previous guest, taking action to bridge the space funding gap in the UK. There are a number of potential solutions which we are looking to, to harness. First is changing public perception. So bringing it down to earth rather than onto the moon. Okay. Second is tax incentives, such as the EIS scheme, the film finance scheme, you know, which would further incentivize funds and investors to pile into private companies applying their technologies and services to the space sector. And the elephant in the room, third is pension reform. But I won't bore you with any more detail on that. So these are completely possible and would have an enormous impact on our sector. Also, we're working with an ESA funded group to create pods of complementary space companies which have reached the end of the runway with nowhere to go. They can't attract private funding. And in my experience, this is largely due to two things. One is a lot of them aren't generating revenue. And the second is they don't have traditional management teams with track records. So we're bundling them together and transforming them into investor ready entities um, uh, that can sell a holistic product and benefit from a broader geographic audience. So it makes sense, doesn't it? Why isn't someone why wasn't someone doing this before? I don't know. My point here is fundraising is not always easy. The first, not always easy. And the first answer is not always fundraising. More often than not, M&A is a better first option for early stage companies. And executed well, it can then make, make them more attractive to investors. So horse before the carriage story. Now we're going to flip into something a bit different and get you thinking about interesting technologies that have been apply, applied to space or vice versa. So here's the first question. How was a felt tipped pin extremely useful in space? And you can put the answers in the, in the chat. We'll give, you the, we'll give you the answer later as well, in case no one guesses it. Is this a Fisher space pen, pen pencil question? Well, the, the, it was used very, it, it has been used very usefully in space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, I, know what it, I know what it is. I know what it is. I know the answer. Shh. I, I won't say. But uh, yes, I, 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 I've got it. You've got it. Don't, don't yeah. tell anybody. Okay, the second it. question is, um, Dallas, uh, what does an ear thermometer have to do with space? Oh, I think I know this one. Excellent. Good. Uh, We'll see what everyone comes up with. I'm sure we have an inventive audience, so <laughs> we'll see. We'll see right. what they, they The point can. there really is, is that, you know, there's a crossover between um, terra firma technologies that are being applied to space. And not all technologies have been manufactured and designed to, for space. So that, that, that's just kind of our, our thinking and how we're, we're thinking about um, putting these pods together is putting companies in into the pods that aren't necessarily currently space companies to create a full ecosystems. So in summary, so while everybody's thinking about the answers to those questions, um, mm -hmm. many barriers to private funding in the UK can easily be removed if the general populace is made aware of and have a better understanding of the importance of the space sector in our economy and a sustainable life on earth. We're grateful to the you know, generous government funding and the work of George Freeman and his colleagues. But I think, and I think you guys would agree, it's now the role of the private financial sector to bridge the gap of funding. And that's, that's our mission. Jody, thank you very, very much. What a terrific talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. A couple of things. Make it basic. I'm going to get that tattooed on my arm. <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm on a mission. My mission in life is to decorporatify the language of, of well, everything really, but particularly space and, and just the corporate you know, landscape. It's, it drives it's not, me crazy. And just just keep things simple. And it's not just the corporates. I think it's, you know, we're equally guilty. I think if you go and ask a professor what the answer to something is, you're not going to get a three three word answer, are you going to get well, a, our lecture? Yeah. So. That, that, yeah. that's yeah we're all good i mean does, does jody just we've got we'll have loads of questions coming in does space have a particular 
communication problem in, in your experience from where you're sitting, the space sector? Yeah, I and mean, we are, we are going to, as part of this roundtable, we are going to start a, 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 a communication initiative. It's not going to cost a, a lot of money to do it. But yeah, we, 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 we want to make it fantastic, don't we? We want to make dazzle people with how fantastic it is. And that's the wrong yeah. thing to do. I think the people watching the BBC, you know, have have you know, partners and things that work in financial services that would be investing in this space. It's it's not just talking, getting to the investor, it's getting to everybody and 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 moving away from, you know, believe it or not, space tourism and 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 moon missions and things like that. And moving down to the fundamentals, people really don't understand how important the space economy is to the UK marketplace. And they need to be investing in this. It's a it's it's critical now the government the uk government is doing the best that they can to continue to fund uh small space companies but they can only do so much it's absolutely critical that the private sector starts deploying more capital towards towards our growing space industry george do feel free to jump in i george is still with us so um do feel free to well thanks it's great as a former reformed vc uh to have jody and her team i'm I was in the life science sector 30 years ago when it was, it's one of the things I love, the vibe of the space sector. It's small. It's very keen to support other entrants. It reminds me of life sciences 30 years ago. And you only need to see the scale of the life science sector now. I'm absolutely no doubt space is, we're in the foothills. And in 20 years, people will say, you mean there were only, there was a time when there were only six space investors in London? Wow. It'll be 60 fast and 600 before long. It's very exciting. Good. Um, Ali, do we have questions for Jody? I'm sure we'll, we've got a bazillion I, I also want to know the answer. So oh, yeah, maybe we'll get, we'll, Ali we'll can get, give us the definitive uh, solution to these. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, 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 we'll get some questions first and then we'll do the pub quiz. Lots of answers coming in to, to Jody's quiz. Um, is it to do with the way that the felt tip pens are pressurised? Pens work okay upside what? down? No, I know what it is. It's not okay. <laughs> and on the, um, on the other question around the... Uh, Thermometer. There we go. The ear thermometer. Is it something to do with infrared technology, Jody? It is. And we do have uh, questions for you. Do you want to go through the answers first? Okay. Well. Okay. Let's do the answers first. So, uh, well, Susie, do you know the answer to to you know the answer to the uh, thermometer? I thought the thermometer was uh, uh, the, the 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 bit I got to was this is infrared technology. That is the yeah. extent of my knowledge. <laughs> yeah. So NASA's Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, in California, um, developed the infrared astronomical satellite IRAS, um, which measured the temperature of stars and planets. And then this technology was then taken on by a company called Diatech Medical, and uh, and they used this infrared um, technology in the thermometer, so allowing um, allowing you to get the temperature of, of a human being within within seconds um, by measuring the heat uh, coming out of the ear, which is quite in, quite interesting. So. I didn't know that, um, and I thought I thought that was a little interesting little piece of uh, of uh, of knowledge. And then on the first question, uh, Dallas, you said you know this answer. I think so. Well, Apollo eleven um, landing. There was a master alarm as they landed on the moon. One of the switches got broken, so Buzz Aldrin improvised by taking the lid off his sharpie and shoving it in the socket and saved the day. That's not the answer, is it? That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? So there you go. Um, I, I wrote a, I wrote a space history book a few years ago, and I, I did a whole chapter on the history of space pens. <laughs> so it's niche. It's, it's niche. niche. It's niche. It's niche. <laughs> um, by the way, I'll, I've got a whole box of unsold books. As I, we'll give one to the competition winner. if anyone. Yeah, if, very cool. Perfect. But any, any any more sort of questions for, for, for Jodie? What... Yeah, lots of questions coming in. Stuart yeah. would like to know, uh, Jodie, what has been the best example of PR that you've seen in the space industry? Well, I think, um, I, I think, oh, God, the best example of PR in the space industry in the UK, I suppose um, the, the catapult is it produces a substantial amount of media 
um, they obviously support enormous amount of, of early stage businesses and um, and they produce a, a lot of media. I suppose um, all Astro Agency is is fantastic. I mean, I'm not saying this just because George is on this talk either. Um, George Freeman has been amazingly impactful on our industry and he gets the word out a lot. I mean, he I spoke he spoke at a FT conference a couple couple years ago. You know, and, and this was fantastic. The whole financial services industry was there, and um, and George was talking about how, what the government is doing to contribute to the space industry, how important it is. Talking about space insurance and things like that. So I think just getting out everybody that's knowledgeable in the sector. If you can speak speak at conferences, if you can, you know, take calls from journalists, if you can put PR out there about your business. That that that's at the absolute um, the absolute least you should be doing really, and also talking about how common technologies apply to the space sector. So rather than talking about you know again as I say rather than mystifying it, make it really basic on on your common technology and how you're applying that to the space sector, and that people will start to get their head around really. Um, what the space sector means. And we do a lot in the agri-tech um, sector as well with George and as well in, in Norfolk and all around the country. And agri-tech is an easy way to explain sort of how the space sector is impacting everybody's daily life and sustainability on Earth. Um, so talking about that, I think, is quite important. There's a there's a, a, a number of organizations in the UK that focus on agri-tech and they're, they're out there, you know, doing quite a lot of PR. There's, um, you know, obviously the universities that are, um, uh, you know, have have courses, master's courses, PhD courses on space is going to have an enormous impact. And so talking about these things, I think, is 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 absolutely fundamental and it needs to be it needs to be uh, more frequent, to be honest. I mean, it needs to be on the likes of the BBC more often where it reaches just everybody. It's really hard. I mean, the thing is, it's, it's you know, I worked at the BBC Science Unit for, for many years and it was it was always kind of space and then dinosaurs and then Egypt and then space. And then there was this kind of kind of wave <laughs> function of, of when when space is popular. But um, now, uh, Susie, there's something Jody said is really important. I think that yeah. after the, the Cornish launch in January. Uh, there was a spate of commentary, wasn't there? You know, an armchair critic saying, oh, well, the Brits, are, you know, and there was a brilliant young woman environmental professor or doctor came on and she was she, I'm sure she was in her 20s she absolutely smashed it and just very powerfully said you know this planet needs space data space observation earth observation data absolutely um no holds barred and I think Jody's point is really well made the more scientists and I mean politicians it's my job but the more people uh, in the sector can come out and just take every little opportunity to speak about um, why it's so key is absolutely vital for our long-term future. Perfect. Got a, a question here that a, a couple of people in our chat are asking about. Um, it started with Steve asking, how can the small investor get to contribute to our space uh, future? Are there any particular um, ISAs? And then another of our uh, guests asked about specific index funds or uh, ETFs. Yeah, there's there's lots of ETFs, um, particularly in the in the U.S. marketplace. Obviously, Seraphim is um, is always keen to take on investment, regardless regardless of the size. What's an ETF? Uh, just for our uh, electronic traded fund. Okay, yeah, well, thank you. Um, and there's new new space funds popping up all the time. So investing in in uh, in a in a in a new space fund in the U.K. or or abroad. But you can contact us and we will find ways for you to put your money in, in, a, in a space company that you find attractive, that you understand and you want to be involved with, particularly if it's strategic for you and you can give some value add, even if that value add is you know, management, help on standard management and, and, and that sort of thing, not, not space knowledge, but other strategic help. Great. How are we doing for time, Ali? I, I, I fear we're uh, we're sort of reaching the end of our hour. We've slightly over 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 overshot our yeah, hour. Yeah, we probably are, unfortunately. But we do have the after party for, for anybody wanting to jump in and keep the conversation going. Do we have a link for the after party we can put up? Do people know how to get to the after party? We do. I'm going to put up a QR code at the end of the session, and there's also Great. a link underneath the video on YouTube as well. 
Great. Well, listen, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. If you want to carry on talking amongst yourselves, discussing some of the things you've heard today uh, from George and from Jody, we're going to put the link up and, and there will be a Zoom uh, area where, where, where you can go and talk and chat. Um, just remains for us to say a huge thank you to Minister George Freeman, MP for Mid-Norfolk. Thank you very much indeed, George, for taking time out of your evening um to, to talk to us i know it's hugely appreciated and likewise jody as well thank you very much for taking the time to to join us on space bar it's been an absolute pleasure please come back again and, and do and do this again soon um huge thank you to astro agency as ever astro agency holding it all together in scotland for us thank you to daniel and we need that to announce the winners of the competition dallas before oh, you wrap up, as yeah, you were doing so well <laughs> crikey yeah so uh, there has been a Space Bar merch competition on social media, and we can announce that the winner is... A long drum roll. Attila07 on Instagram. So uh, you get... <laughs> Well done. <laughs> we have such high production value now we've got Ali running the I, show. I just wasn't Great. expecting it. So you'll get some uh, Space Bar merch. And anyone else... Uh, the more competitions coming up so do follow Astro Agency uh, for, for updates on their social media channels um, you can get Space Bar swag yourself you can just buy some if you want to uh, by going to www.spacestore.co uh, and the, the profits go to Ocean Mind so uh, do be one of the cool kids and get one of those t-shirts or a poster or I think a hoodie as well you can buy which yeah. Dallas and I both proudly have um, and just to wrap up, there are a few industry events that are coming up that uh, we mentioned on the last Space Bar, actually, but uh, we wanted to bring up here as well. Um, there's a consortium, Space Scotland Space-Based Agriculture Knowledge Exchange Consortium Workshop on September the 15th. So please do register and we can put a link in the chat so that you can go ahead and do that. Focusing on the untapped potential of space data in enhancing agricultural practices. We've been talking a bit about that this evening, too. And finally, Fortitude. If you remember from a few space bars ago, we had a documentary, Torsten Hoffman's documentary, Fortitude. If you uh, have an event and you would like to play this, then please do get in touch with Torsten or with Astro Agency um, and uh, they can enable that to happen. OK, so we have another space bar happening next month, so the 28th of September. Um, you can find a link to sign up for that space bar underneath the video where you're watching us now. So do sign up to join us at the end of September um, and send your ideas for topics and news and, and guests to us as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Great. That's right it. Down. We will see you next <laughs> month. Enjoy Zoom. Enjoy the after party. Yes. See you next month. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jodie.